Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's Master of Ceremonies, the President of the Cato Institute, Peter Gettler. Thank you. Thank you. I always get applause before I speak. Not very often afterwards. On behalf of the Cato Institute Board of Directors and all of my colleagues at the Institute, thank you so much for being here tonight. The sacrifices that we make for liberty. I hate wearing a tuxedo. And every time I do, I have to try to remember how to tie a bow tie. But there's one sacrifice I'm happy to say I don't have to make tonight. When my beloved Celtics made the conference finals, I had a sinking feeling that game three would be scheduled for tonight. But much to my relief, the NBA decided that an aging LeBron James needed three days of rest <laughs> to give the Cavaliers a fighting chance in the series. It would have been embarrassing and really shameful if the president of Cato had to call in sick for the Freeman Prize dinner. Bob, Bob Levy, our chairman, I, I wouldn't have done that. Not for game three. For game seven, definitely. <laughs> for game three, I wouldn't have. Well, probably not. In all seriousness, um, I consider it my honor and privilege to be the president of Cato. And when I was asked by the board to join the Institute three years ago, it immediately came to my mind that one of my responsibilities, and I think I told this story two years ago, was that I was going to uh, have to preside over this event. And I have to tell you, it's one of the greatest pleasures of my association with the Institute, because this is one of the most inspirational celebrations of freedom that I think we have. And it's tremendous uh, evening of fellowship with people who are friends of Liberty, friends of Cato, and friends of Cynthia and me. And it's great to have you all here tonight. There's, there are so many individuals in this room whom I greatly admire because of the energy, the tremendous generosity, and the uh, commitment that they bring to advancing our values and trying to realize our shared vision of a free and open society where every person maintains ownership of their own life, where every person is free to imagine their own dreams, where every person has the responsibility to meet life's challenges and the opportunity to achieve those dreams, and where every person has the fulfillment and satisfaction that comes from meeting those challenges successfully and accomplishing those dreams. Without interference from the state or so-called help from the government. But let me be honest about something that does make me unhappy and bothers me a little bit. It's not having to tie a bow tie because thanks to YouTube, I've got that down. But because what we're doing is hard, because what we're doing is important, and because, as Thomas Jefferson said, the natural course of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground, we sometimes get discouraged. And this discouragement can cause us to lose perspective. So I often hear people, too often, saying that we're doomed, freedom is doomed. They imply that there's a futility to what we're trying to do. And they say that the forces of statism are winning. They contend that we're living through what will end up being the eclipse of freedom in America. And when feelings like that are expressed, our best response must be a message of optimism, that we cannot believe and will not accept that freedom will not win. We must believe that freedom will win. First, because to believe freedom is only receding is simply not true. There are indeed places in which government only seems to grow. But when we open the aperture a bit and give ourselves perspective, there are always places in which freedom is winning 
as well as places in which freedom is losing. I'm not saying we should be overly optimistic or not concerned because we know what we're up against. But the right perspective is critical. There's a big difference between the reality I see believing freedom is doomed and uh, the reality I see in believing that freedom is doomed. I'm reminded of a story from a few years ago when Clarence Thomas a, paid a visit to Cato. And he saw something written at Cato that said, since the American Revolution, government has steadily grown and freedom has steadily receded. And Justice Thomas said that it didn't feel that way to him because at the time of the revolution, he reminded us, his forebears were held in chattel slavery. That's perspective. We must believe that freedom can win. Second, because to think otherwise compromises our chances of success. It's self-defeating. I don't think Chris Preble, our Vice President for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies, would appreciate my using martial analogies. But Chris couldn't be here tonight, so I'm going to have a go at it. Have you ever heard of an army that was able to capture a hill, charging onto the field, saying that they were doomed. If we don't think we can be successful, we're compromising our very chances of success. We must believe that freedom will win third, because if I'm wrong and we're indeed living through the eclipse of freedom in America, then at least we're gonna go down swinging. And we're gonna make sure that our kids see and appreciate our example so that they feel a responsibility for preserving freedom for future generations of Americans the same the way that we do. We must believe that freedom will win fourth, because if we really do believe that the beacon of liberty is shining its last, we're doing a great disservice to the example, the inspirational examples we have from the people we're honoring tonight. If we allow ourselves to get down and feel sorry for ourselves and feel that we, what we're doing is futile, then I think we're abdicating a responsibility that their example places on us. And, if, and uh, I'd like to mention a couple of the folks who will be part of the program tonight, Sergio Mora. Tonight's keynote speaker, Sergio Moro, is a shining example of the fact that one person, one courageous individual, can make a huge difference in his country and the world. No one accomplishes things by themselves, and you have to work with many others in order to have a huge impact on the world. In fact, the foundation for Judge Moro's work was laid by reforms that were instituted in Brazil. But he shows us, nonetheless, the tremendous contributions one man or woman can make. Um, and when you stand up for the rule of law and become absolutely indispensable to creating dramatic and positive change in your country. Despite the deterioration in the rule of law and the rise of cronyism that we've experienced in the United States in recent years, we nonetheless don't face anything compared to what Judge Moro faces in Brazil because the rule of law here is still relatively strong and corruption is not yet endemic. So how, in light of Judge Moro's example, can we not be hopeful about creating change in the United States? And how, in light of Judge Moro's example, can we not feel a tremendous responsibility to see that the U.S. becomes once again the freest country? Consider also the man in whose name and memory we gather tonight, and in whose name we'll honor the ladies in white. Milton Friedman is also an example of the fact that one man can make a tremendous contribution to the advancement of liberty. Milton Friedman warned us that liberty could be fragile and had to be strenuously defended. But over the course of his life, he saw the ideas of liberty triumph ideas that he so eloquently championed. And he witnessed the spread of freedom over much of the earth during his lifetime. And then there are the ladies in white. Can we really consider the possibility that freedom is doomed in the United States? When Las Damas de Blanco are willing to risk everything, fighting for it in a criminal communist police state, if anyone could be forgiven, for giving up hope of living in freedom, 
it would be the people of Cuba. The ladies in white face oppression that we can't imagine and have to take risks that we don't need to in order to stand up for freedom. And in doing so, they have won the release of their husbands. Does their willingness to risk harassment, persecution, violence, and worse, not place a responsibility on us to fight for freedom in the United States, and also to be successful in creating the free and prosperous society we envision. I can't possibly square such a sense of responsibility with a belief that freedom won't only survive but can continue to grow in the United States. Lastly, I remember years before I joined Cato, I also found myself slipping into pessimism and I made the mistake of asserting to Ed Crane that freedom was doomed. And Ed got very mad at me, as he's probably gotten mad at some of you in the past. He suggested to me, did I think what we're trying to do, preserving and restoring liberty in the United States, was any harder than what the founders did in establishing a new country under a theory of natural rights with a government of limited power. And uh, he was right. I was a little bit ashamed to think what we're up against is greater than what those men who pledged to each other, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, when they had to meet and overcome challenges that are so much more than what we're trying to do, how can we possibly think that we're doomed? To all who toil around the world to make their countries a little bit freer, the United States has always been a beacon of freedom. We may indeed believe that that beacon burns a little bit dimmer today. And it's the recognition that it could go out that gives such a sense of determination and urgency to our work. But if we indeed convince ourselves that that light will go out, we will assuredly fail to meet our obligation. And that's the obligation we owe to the ladies in white and others like them around the world, and as well to future generations of Americans to make that beacon burn as bright as it ever has. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your support of Cato, and thank you so much for your support of Liberty. We'd now like to introduce you to the history and motivation for the Friedman Prize with a short video. Those of us who were fortunate enough to live and be raised in a reasonably free society tend to underestimate the importance of freedom. We tend to take it for granted. We tend to forget that freedom is a rare and delicate plant. Milton Friedman devoted his academic career to advancements in the field of economics but he gave his life to the cause of human liberty. Friedman's ideas on economic freedom hugely influenced governments, revolutionized establishment economic thinking across the globe, and they've been employed extensively by emerging economies for decades. His television series, Free to Choose, and the companion book, co-authored by his wife Rose, remain an international landmark for their impact on economics and social philosophy. The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want, to buy in the cheapest market around the world, to sell in the dearest market around the world. But most important of all, if they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. His major contributions to economics are too numerous to list that they culminated in a Nobel Prize in 1976. Friedman's public face, however, will always be as a defender of individual liberty and free markets. The world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements 
of civilization have not come from government bureaus. If you want to know where the masses are worth, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. In 2002, the Cato Institute began awarding the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty to honor significant contribution in the advancement of human freedom. Previous recipients of the Milton Friedman Prize include the late pioneering British development economist Peter Bauer, Peruvian economist and property rights reformer Hernando de Soto, former Estonian Prime Minister Mart Lahr, Jan Goicochea, leader of the nonviolent pro democracy student movement in Venezuela, dissident Iranian writer and journalist Akbar Ganji, one of China's most influential scholars in individual rights and free markets, economist Mao Yushu, Leszek Bolsarowicz, former deputy prime minister and finance minister of Poland, whose free market reforms transformed Poland's economic landscape and Danish journalist Fleming Rose, a champion of liberal values and defender of free speech. It's through this prize that the Cato Institute proudly honors Milton Friedman and the cause for which he labored so long. I have some names to remember, so I, I do need to find my notes. I'd like to take a few minutes now to offer our sincere gratitude to a number of people who are with us here tonight. First, this event and many Cato events would not be possible without the generous support of the Smith Family Foundation. Don Smith and Julie Smith are with us tonight. And I'd like to offer my personal thanks for their generosity and all the things they do to have such a tremendous impact in support of liberty. I'd also like to recognize Don in his role as a member of Cato's Board of Directors and also his participation on uh, the International Selection Committee for this year's Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty. Don, thanks so much. At Cato, our organization is indeed blessed to have a group a very passionate, very generous, and uh, as the CEO, I'll say very strict board of directors stewarding the organization. I'd like to recognize uh, the, the, uh, the board members who are with us tonight. Hold your applause, please, until uh, I'm finished reading the list. But in addition to Don, we have Baron Bond, Bob Gelfond, David Humphreys, Jay LaPere, Ken Levy, board chair Bob Levy, and Fred Young. Thanks so much for your contributions to Cato. And we are really proud of the International Selection Committee that we assemble every two years to, uh, to decide who the recipient of the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty will be. And the, uh, the list of, uh, of this year's committee is included in your program. But I would like to recognize Sloan Frost, who is uh, with us at tonight's event. Sloan. And it's my great honor to count as a colleague someone who has been a senior fellow at the Cato Institute for the last two years. Uh, he is one of the world's foremost and most courageous advocates for freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And uh, he's with us here tonight, the uh, recipient of the 2016 Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty, our colleague Fleming Rose. There are two men who have had a long association with this event uh, who have sadly passed away recently. Um, we'll should greatly miss the fellowship and help of two longtime defenders of liberty, but remember them with fondness 
Harold Bowen, and George Yeager. Harold Bowen was a supporter of Cato for 20 years, but his special passion was for the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty. And he was a member of the host committee for this event every year that it's been held. He was so appreciative of his long and generous association with the Institute and the prize. And all the positive attributes of this evening will be diminished just a little bit by the fact that he will no longer be joining us for these dinners. But we do thank and recognize Harold so much. George Yeager has been a great and generous friend to Cato and to Liberty. His memory will be forever enshrined at the many Cato events that we hold at our headquarters in the George M. Yeager Conference Center. But even more than a supporter, George was a friend. George and I knew each other only casually through our mutual attendance at Cato events, but we didn't become friends until Cynthia and I bumped into George and shared dinner with him, not in New York City where he lived or Connecticut where we lived, but about 8,000 miles away in Deking, China. Like many colleagues at Cato, we later enjoyed George's hospitality at his beloved home in Antigua, which he and his wife Barbara had dubbed Moongate, and where George's required salutation and toast was Shu, the Chinese character that adorned much of Moongate and is a blessing for longevity. George indeed lived a long and full life, and he never ceased offering kindness and gentlemanliness. He never contacted me via email without inquiring as to Cynthia's health. One of my fondest memories will be on Thanksgiving of 2016. I received an email from George in the morning. The subject line was all caps, Happy Thanksgiving. Among my many blessings that I have to be thankful for, Peter, is my friendship with the Gettlers and the good news that Cynthia is up to returning to Moongate. Shoo indeed. George. Your many friends here miss you, George. Our keynote speaker tonight is a national hero in Brazil. Ever since his country was rocked by one of the largest corruption scandals in history, known as Operation Car Wash, since 2014, the investigation has uncovered billions of dollars in bribes involving hundreds of the country's top politicians and executives. Judge Sergio Mora has presided over some of the biggest cases in this scandal. He has been credited with changing the way that corruption cases are tried in Brazil, ensuring that nobody is given special treatment because of their wealth or political status. His principled stand for equal justice and the rule of law has made him into something of a celebrity. When Brazilians took to the streets for record-breaking protests against corruption in their government, many of them wore masks of Judge Moro's face or carried Sergio Moro dolls wearing superhero capes. Tourists have even been brought in by the busload to visit his offices. We are honored to have him with us tonight. Interviewing Judge Morrow will be Mary Anastasia O'Grady, the award-winning America's columnist for the Wall Street Journal, where she focuses primarily on Latin American politics, economics, and business. She joined the journal in 1995 and has been an editorial board member since 2005. She is also a board member for the Liberty Fund. Ms. O'Grady has received many awards for her writing, including the Walter Judge Freedom Award, the Thomas Jefferson Award from the Association of Private Enterprise Education, the Bastiat Prize of Journalism, the Inter-American Press Association's Daily Gleaner Award for editorial commentary, and an honorary doctorate from Francisco Marroquin University. A great friend of Cato, I can't think of another journalist whose work is imbued with such a sincere appreciation for liberty, a disdain for the despots and elites who would threaten it, and an admiration for the many everyday men and women who seek to defend it. Her many years of insightful commentary on the struggle for liberty in Latin America should make for an interesting discussion tonight. But first, let us show you a video introducing a little bit more about Judge Morrow's work. 
Brazil's largest ever corruption investigation. The biggest corruption scandal in Brazilian history. What is now known as Lava Jato, or the Car Wash Investigation. It's known as Operation Car Wash, and it's being led by a small group of idealistic young Brazilian prosecutors and a crusading judge. We were living in exceptional circumstances because the corruption was so widespread. Weak enforcement of the law have generated a free environment for the development of bribery, kickbacks, and corruption. And you need to do something a big to, to stop it. Former President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva could be arrested at any moment. The former Speaker of the Lower House to at least 15 20 years in prison. top executives from eight major companies. More than 150 executives and politicians have already been arrested or convicted. Millions of Brazilians protested in the streets against corruption and in support of the Lava Jato operation. Judge Moro has become something of a folk hero. We have to face the problem, and facing it, I think we'll have a better country. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Anastasia O'Grady and Judge Sergio Moro. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our conversation with Judge Moro. We're very lucky to have him with us here this evening. And in, I want to let you know that in preparing for this event, I started reading through the press clips of the last four years of the work that you were doing and the prosecutors were doing uh, in Brazil. And I was reminded of Mark Twain's observation that truth is stranger than fiction, but it's because fiction ha is obliged to stick to the possibilities, and truth isn't. And if you read what happened in Operation Car Wash, it really is a truth that is way stranger than fiction in a country, I would say, that is enormously important for the region. So the changes that Judge Morrow has brought about, I think, have big implications for uh, the rest of Latin America. Just to summarize for those of you who aren't lucky enough to have a Wall Street Journal subscription, <laughs> um, Basically, what was going on here was that Petrobras, the big oil company, state-owned oil company, was um, awarding contracts to private construction companies, and those construction companies were padding their bids. And so Petrobras would give the contract to the construction company, the construction company would give kickbacks to oil company executives, to politicians, to uh, some of the members of the corporations, and as we know, it ended up also going to former President Lula da Silva, who is now in jail. Um, he was originally convicted for nine years, but on appeal, he got 12 years. <laughs> um, and I should add also that, that that money was also being funneled through offshore corporations into um, a political slush funds, so it was also being kicked back into the party. Now, Operation Car Wash as a novel would be rejected by a publisher as way too fantastic. But mm. uh, in terms of um, what's actually gone on in Brazil, I think one of the most interesting things are the human beings who made this happen. So you are a trial judge in Brazil, slightly different system than we have here in the US. Um, but there's also a team of prosecutors, and that team of prosecutors has been called sometimes in the press the nine horsemen of the apocalypse, because it, this scandal truly rocked the entire political economic uh, core of, of this huge country. And I, was, I, I thought that it would be uh, interesting to hear from you what was it about those human beings? I mean, you've had trial judges and prosecutors in Brazil for 30 years in the, in the democracy, in the post-military government democracy. Um, but this seemed like a very special collection of people, and uh, both in terms of their education, their training, but also their values. And so do you have any, any insights about how these people tended, just ended up coming together and following this trail? And, basically opening the web of corruption? Well, first, let me say briefly, I'm honored to be here. 
to receive this invitation and uh, thank you for the kind words and I like the video. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to have you here also, uh, Mr. Grady. Uh, it's difficult to say. Let me say that uh, it's all institutional work. Uh, of course, uh, there are individual merits, but uh, the investigation, uh, the procedures, and the results achieved uh, until now uh, are a consequence of an institutional framework, uh, prosecutors, police officers. Uh, my work as a judge, in part, I have, I have some merit of uh, but there are the, the work of appeal judges, of the superior courts in Brasilia. What is really interesting is that uh, we had in Brazil several criminal scandals in the past, but usually we read about them only on newspapers, and uh, that cases sometimes they were never brought to the courts or when they uh, were brought to the courts, uh, nothing happened, and things start to change. Uh, maybe since an uh, important decision by our Supreme Court in 2012 in another criminal scandal called uh, uh, Mensalon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand that this car wash operation is a kind of uh, a follow-up of this uh, president uh, by the Brazilian Supreme Court. Uh, so, in, in an unprecedented manner, now we have about, uh, considering the cases are red triad, 33 cases, we have about uh, 150 uh, persons convicted uh, for bribery and money laundering in Brazil, and these convictions involved very powerful people businessmen, uh, owners, and executives of these Brazilian construction companies, executives of Petrobras, and also high-ranked uh, politicians, like the former Speaker of the House, congressmen, senators, and even a former president of the country. Well, so I guess what you're saying then is that there's almost a generational change in the judicial branch. I'm wondering, do you, what kind of uh, impact is this having in the political class? I mean, there's a, you get a sense from looking at this that, that, that uh, bribery was this sort of the status quo. I mean, it was a, a sort of a natural thing that politicians engaged in. Um, do you see some kind of giant um, shift in the way that politicians will behave going forward, or is it going to just be a constant inch-by-inch inch battle? Oh, reducing the impunity and uh, sending uh, important criminals by due process uh, to prison, suffering the consequences of their uh, criminal behavior, uh, I understand this is an important step, and uh, in time we will have, probably I cannot foresee the future, less levels uh, of corruption. Uh, in truth, some of the criminals who made uh, plea agreements or confessed their crimes, they, they told us that uh, paying bribes was a kind of the rule of the game. The rule of the game on Petrobras contracts was that you have to pay bribes to have the contract. And a share of the bribes uh, stayed with the executives of Petrobras, which is a state-owned company, and uh, the other part went to the politicians. I have an uh, infinite hope that uh, this could change this culture of graft. But uh, uh, I, I cannot foresee the future, but I have a really hope that uh, people will understand. And in certain way, uh, this reveals that uh, uh, Brazilian democracy is strong. The institutions are working. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, if you allow me, I, I usually like to, to quote uh, a phrase from former President Theodore Roosevelt. He made a very strong speech against corruption in 1903 before the United States Congress. And uh, I'll, I'll not quote uh, entirely, but he said once, uh, the exposure uh, of corruption, the exposure and the punishment of corruption is an honor to a nation, not a disgrace. Uh, the shame lies uh, in toleration, not in correction. And I understand that this is the feeling, this is my feeling, and this is the feeling of the vast majority of uh, Brazilian people who have a chance to uh, build a stronger commitment to the rough law and to democracy. Well, that's interesting. You know, the other player in all of this were the, the, um, the construction companies. And uh, we were talking earlier about the fact that Petrobras had, has recognized $2 billion in bribes in this scandal. And, Surely the number is higher than that if you include all of the other scandals that are connected to this. But um, one of the big companies was Ojebrek, which is a construction company. And I was fascinated to read that Ojebrek had its own department of bribery. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wondered when I read that, and of course OAS also got into trouble, um, what kinds of um, changes do you think you might see in corporate governance in Brazil as a result of this? Is that, is that area being affected at all by this? I believe so. I, I, uh, I'm hearing a lot in Brazil about uh, compliance and the necessity to have real compliance uh, on these uh, giant corporations and big corporations. And uh, although these big construction companies, as Odebrecht, as Andrade Gutierrez, although they committed very serious crime uh, at the past, at least after some time, after shutting down the department for bribes, <laughs> that was a surprise for us also. Uh, and you know, just one thing, uh, uh, until I finish the other story. Uh, it was amazing because they, the, this department for bribes, of bribes worked even during the investigation. And they even paid the new CEO of Petrobras, who was put on charge to clean the company. I can speak about it because it's a case already tried. Of course, as a judge, I cannot speak about pending case. But, uh, well, what uh, they have done was shameful. They commit a lot of crimes, not only in Brazil, but it was discovered that they also paid brides in other countries. Uh, Peru is an example, uh, but there are others. And Peru, I think, is really doing a good job to build their own case. Uh, but uh, during the investigation, they decide to uh, make uh, Lenin's deals with the prosecutors. In these Lenin's deals, they recognize their wrongdoings. They assume the compromise to pay fines, millions, billions uh, in fines, and to cooperate with the investigations and to change their behavior. So even for, for them, for these companies, and I think that's very important when a company is involved in criminal behavior that uh, it recognizes their wrongdoings, it changes their behavior. Even for them, there is a hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even for them. <laughs> um, one of the things that was very important in your investigation, I understood, was um, preventative detention and plea bargaining. And some of your critics 
said that um, but well, they, they criticized you for using preventative detention, which it seemed to me like turned out to be very effective. Um, but there's also a potential for abuse with preventative detention and plea bargaining. Can you make some comments about how, you know, how the Brazilian system is set up to protect against the abuse of maybe a judge that just is ambitious or political or something like that? Yes, that's a very good question. There have been some concerns about pretrial detentions. And uh, you're absolutely right. I think uh, pretrial detentions should be an exception in any judicial system. But a lot of countries, Brazil and even United States, uh, in these countries, it's allowed, it's allowed to the judge to order pretrial detention in, circum in exceptional circumstances. So a uh, United States judge could deny uh, bail for a defendant when he understands that he presents a risk to the society, to another individual, or f uh, for the evidence, or if there is a risk that he will flee. Uh, he will fly, sorry. Well, uh, if you look at the specific cases in Brazil, uh, pretrial detention orders uh, were given in special circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, the first director of Petrobras, the first executive of Petrobras, who have been arrested by trial, pretrial detention order, he was arrested because it was discovered that he was destroying or hiding paper evidence. By the other side, a lot of these uh, convicted criminals, they held uh, millions of dollars or euros in offshore accounts abroad. So there was a risk of a potential flight mm -hmm. or a risk that they, will, they would uh, uh, they would uh, somehow hide this, again this money. And if you take the example of a company who had a specific department uh, dedicated to paid bribes, well, you, you need to do something strong. So they understand the message that they could not do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if they pay bribes even during the investigation, well, th that's a risk uh, of new crimes, mm -hmm. and you need to do something. So, uh, but all pretrial order detentions were ordered only when uh, we have strong evidence that uh, those defendants uh, were probably guilty from their crimes. And you, 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 we don't need to overestimate it. To give it an example, today I have nine deten defendants uh, on pretrial detention without conviction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. you. You have studied, obviously you studied law in Brazil, but you've also studied a short program at Harvard. Um, you did a, a, a program on combating money laundering at the State Department. And I've read that you've also um, taken an interest in reading about the Italian prosecutors who have dealt with organized crime uh, in their own country. Are you optimistic that um, organized crime can be combated with, um, with the will and the, modern, the tools of a modern liberal democracy? Because it seems like organized crime and transnational crime is growing and, and, and becoming more difficult to um, you know, police, and, and it's, it's, it's threatening a lot of um, free societies. Um, I'm pretty confident that uh, democracies and free societies are the only way to, to fight uh, organized crime. Uh, if you don't have, uh, uh, for example, freedom of press, uh, if you don't have uh, the possibility to uh, communicate to public opinion, if you don't have uh, trials open to the public, uh, it's very difficult. 
one of the things that I understand uh, that was a, a key reason to the relative success of the investigation in Brazil was the strong support from Brazilian public opinion, as it was shown at the video. Millions of Brazilians went to the streets to support the investigation and to protest against corruption. And this uh, gave us uh, the necessary strength uh, to go on, to keep going. Because when we have these cases against uh, powerful defendants, powerful businessmen, powerful politicians, there is also a risk that they will try by improper means to obstruct justice. And your tools are transparency and the support of the population of the people. Of course, no judge will try a case based on public opinion. That's wrong. You have to try the case based on evidence and on the law. But the public opinion is a strong medicine against obstruction of justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have time for one more question. So I have my chance to quote Thomas Jefferson, uh, which I think is mandatory here at Cato. Um, Thomas, Jeff <laughs> Thomas Jefferson wrote about the importance of what he called equal and exact justice to all men of whatever state or persuasion. And you know, obviously all modern liberal democracies strive for rule of law and equality under the law. I think that's what was so admirable about your investigation because it was powerful people who were, who were called to account. What do you think the um, impact of your work in Brazil might have on the rest of the region? Because you look around South America, Central America, it's had this consistent problem with the rule of law more than anything. Even when they tried to do the right things on the economy and on the monetary front, the rule of law is really always just one battle that hasn't been won. And I'm wondering if maybe your work will influence some of other countries in the region. Do you have any insights about that? Well, let me say first that you are absolutely right. Absolute right. It's all about the rule of law. Uh, no one is above the law. Uh, that's an important lesson, not only for Brazil, but for other countries, even mature democracies. And uh, all we want uh, uh, is clean government, a clean market, freedom from a corrupted government. Uh, I have been, in the last two years, in countries uh, like Argentina, Peru, and Mexico. And I was very uh, well received on these countries, not only uh, by authorities, but by uh, the civil society. And what I see is a strong feeling that uh, things have to change in Latin America. Uh, all countries in the region, some, some of them more, some of them less, have problems, serious problems with corruption and uh, with the enforcement of the law. In certain way, uh, because we also discovered bribes paid by Brazilian companies. Let's not vilif vilify Brazilian companies. Other companies <laughs> paid bribes as well. But as we discovered that, we share the evidence with these countries, and they are, some of them are building their cases. Some of them are not reacting, I think, in the proper way. And uh, by the other side, there are interesting new cases appearing in some countries in Latin America, and not only there, uh, that are totally independent from our case. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not only Latin America. You can, uh, you can say about uh, the cases in South Korea and South Africa. So maybe nowadays there is a world movement, 
I'm not, I'm not so sure about that, but uh, people in democracy are, uh, are not anymore tolerating so much corruption. And this is what gives us uh, hope that this could change. This past of impunity in Brazil make a lot of Brazilians believe that it was a kind of uh, natural fate or tropical disease. But it's just cultural weakness. Mm -hmm. And in the democracy, you could change it. Well, that's a great note to end our, our, our discussion on. Please join me in thanking Judge Morrow for being here with us this evening. Just say one thing that I, for, I, I, I forgot early. Congratulations to Damas and Blanco for your work. Thank you. To present the 2018 recipient of the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty, please welcome Rosa Maria Paya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The 75 are the heroes of an, of an effort called the Varela Project. Citizen leaders that together with my father, Oswaldo Paya, dare to defy the regime, to gather a movement of tens of thousands of Cubans demanding the real change. Together with them, there were the bold independent journalists that break the wall of silence about the repressive regime and the efforts of the human rights defenders. When that March 2003, the hate darkened our Cuban spring, and those 75 activists were hunted and imprisoned by the dictator many in the world believed that that was the end of the Cuban resistance. And it was indeed a huge stroke. But it was not the end. It was actually a painful new beginning. Suddenly, the wife, daughters, sisters, and mothers of the imprisoned heroes stand up for their freedom, demonstrating social courage that they amazed the world. Women that nobody knew, dressing white clothes, were then taking the streets, Sunday after Sunday, right after mass, peacefully demanding the liberation of their dear ones, with a flower in their hands as their only weapon. By doing so, the ladies in white returned the hope to many. The cruelest repression and beatings never stopped then. These women persevered. And when the criminal regime let Orlando Zapata die in prison in 2010, the ladies kept fighting even harder until the last of the 75 was released. And then they continued for the liberation of all the other political prisoners. And when the hospital of the dictatorship ended with the life of the brave Laura Poyan, Berta Soler took her burden and keep walking with the ladies of the freedom. And when the Castro brothers finally killed my father six years ago, these women made a human change around his coffin to protect his dead body from the repressors. 
and today. When the repression is so hard that the, the dictatorship doesn't even allow them to get to mass each Sunday, these women face beatings, jail, and harassment, but they keep trying Sunday after Sunday. And still, the Castro brothers are so coward that they prevented Berta Soler to get here tonight. To her, to Leticia, to Saili, to Belka, and to all the brave ladies that are locked in our island. And to the sweet Laura Poyan and Gloria Maya, and all the ladies in white that have passed away. And to Blanca, to Dolia, to Lourdes, to all the ladies in white that live and suffer the exile. To all of them, my gratitude and my admiration. As my father said, As my father said in 2005, these women relatives were imprisoned to kill the hope, to bury the spring. But hope is alive, and the ladies in white are the flower of the spring. For all this and much more, I truly thank Cato Institute for honoring the ladies in white with the Milton Freeman Award for Advancing Freedom. And in the name of the Cuban people, I thank all and every of the ladies in white. God bless you today and always. Dios la bendiga. And now you'll see a short video on the life and work of the ladies. Freedom of thought, freedom of expression. These fundamental freedoms are essential to individual liberty and flourishing free societies. For many, these inalienable rights are woven into the fabric of our daily lives and taken for granted not in Cuba. The Cuban revolution that brought Fidel Castro to power in 1959 is a well-known and often romanticized story. Castro, a lawyer turned guerrilla leader, and his small band of revolutionary fighters overthrow the brutal and unpopular dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista. The Cuban people, weary of corruption and hardship, celebrate as Castro promises social and economic reforms. Yo, como la mayoría del pueblo de Cuba, apoyamos la revolución al principio, en enero de 1959, porque pensamos que todo aquel torrente de justicia social, de respeto a la dignidad del ser humano que Castro estaba prometiendo, iba a ser realidad. Pero muy pronto comprendí que Castro lo que estaba haciendo era sencillamente sustituyendo la dictadura de Batista por su propia dictadura comunista. Castro consolidates his power. He recruits the Cuban people to monitor and inform on their neighbors. Political dissent and independent journalism are criminalized. It soon becomes clear that Castro's brand of reform comes at a steep price for the Cuban people, individual freedom. Are you a communist, Fidel? Well, well. Wait for the history. The history will say what we are. Almost 45 years after Castro took power, Cuba remains firmly in the grip of his authoritarian regime and ever-present revolution. Hundreds of thousands of Cubans have fled the island seeking personal safety and freedom in Europe and the United States. Those who stay live under the constant threat of persecution and violence from the regime's thuggish state security. Is 
very hard because of the consequences are real. The oppression is there. The threats are there. It's to live with the certainty that there are others that are watching each of your steps and are ready to repress you, to menace you, or to act against your life. In March of 2003, as the world's attention is focused on the impending U.S. invasion of Iraq, the Cuban government arrests 75 dissidents, including independent journalists and human rights activists. All are charged with conspiring to undermine the state and in summary trials are sentenced from 6 to 28 years in prison. Yo fundé una agencia de noticias que se llamaba Cuba Press, que era un pequeño grupo de periodistas que hacíamos este comentarios, hacíamos noticias, este sobre todo de, de, de lo, que, lo que hacían los grupos los grupos pacíficos de oposición y también dando nuestras opiniones sobre lo que estaba pasando en Cuba y me condenaron por ese trabajo de periodista independiente a 20 años de cárcel. Porque era un juicio sumario. En menos de 72 horas se llevaron a 75 opositores y decían que eran de la droga. El problema es que al otro día eh, a mí me parecía de pronto que La Habana estaba como muerta. Era como un silencio. Entonces yo fui a un mercado y me dijeron que se habían llevado a la gente de la droga. Y dije, no, no se llevaron a la gente de la droga, se llevaron a gente que no piensan como el gobierno. While Rivero and the others disappear behind bars, the international community condemns the crackdown and its brazen violation of human rights. At home, families of those arrested seek answers and are met with official rejection and harassment. With no help from the state, the wives turn to each other for information and support. They will become the Damas de Blanco, the ladies in white. Se formó de una manera espontánea porque nadie entendía por qué si no, si nadie tenía ni un cuchillo ni un revólver ni nada se lo llevaron porque porque a, a este señor a, a Fidel Castro se le antojó decirlo de, mandar a acabar con la disidencia y no sabía ni nosotros tampoco que las mujeres iban a defender a los maridos. Understanding that there is power in numbers, the women begin attending Sunday church service at St. Rita's in Havana. They wear white to symbolize peace and dignity. They carry a flower. They hold signs and wear shirts bearing the images of their imprisoned loved ones. In peaceful protest, they ask that the prisoners be released. The regime labels the Damas de Blanco counter-revolutionaries and begins a relentless campaign of harassment, intimidation, and violence. Despite the attacks, the Damas persist, and persist, and persist. Their leader, retired Spanish teacher Laura Poyan, becomes a powerful spokesperson for the struggle for liberty in Cuba. No vamos a dejar de luchar. Ahora más que nunca, tenemos que ser fuertes y continuar para alcanzar nuestro verdadero y gran premio por el que luchamos, la libertad de los prisioneros políticos. Eight years after the crackdown, all of the Black Spring prisoners have been released due to constant pressure from the Damas de Blanco, intervention by the international community, and the regime's desire to tidy its human rights image. Months after her husband, Hector Maceda, was freed, Laura Poyan dies under suspicious circumstances, and Berta Soler becomes the group's leader. The Damas de Blanco vowed to continue their fight for the rights of the Cuban people. Bueno, los cubanos lo más importante es que vamos a unirnos, que todos salgan de su casa, salgan a las calles, con principio y con día, pacíficamente a luchar por lo que nos han robado el gobierno de Cuba, la libertad. Cuba's new president has pledged fidelity to the military regime 
and has made it clear that Raul Castro will continue to call the shots. So where does that leave the Cuban people and their quest for liberty? How the future unfolds in Cuba is impossible uh, to predict. Conditions, economic and social, on the island continue to deteriorate. Repression has increased, and it will continue to increase. And as that happens, the role of the ladies in white will become increasingly important, and so will their message. It is that even in the face of the worst repression, life is worth living and it's worth living on one's own terms. And that's a message that the rest of the world needs to acknowledge, and it needs to let the, the damas de blanco know that they're not alone, they're not forgotten, and that the civilized world shares these values with them. Para Cuba, espero libertad, porque la libertad es una necesidad del ser humano. Un hombre, un ser humano, una mujer, no pueden realizarse nunca plenamente, ni física ni espiritualmente, si no tienen libertad. Las damas de blanco son un símbolo de las ansias de libertad que tienen los cubanos y además es una demostración irrefutable de la naturaleza criminal de la dictadura de Cuba. Oh, it's very important the testimony and the example that they set for the rest of the Cuban people. Cubans that admire them in secret or that dare to express their admiration for these ladies, for these brave women that dare to confront and challenge such a big monster that is the Cuban secret police and that is the generals in power. You cannot see that and remain the same. Tonight, we honor the Damas de Blanco, courageous defenders of freedom, powerful messengers to the world that the struggle for liberty in Cuba will not be silenced by propaganda, intimidation, or violence, but will continue until its people are free to speak their minds, follow their hearts, and have a say in their futures. It's my honor. It's, it's my honor to invite three of the ladies in white to the stage to receive the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty. Blanca Reyes, Dolia Leal, and Lourdes Esquivel. It's an honor to present this to you. The Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty, 2018, Las Damas de Blanco, in recognition of their courageous, peaceful, and steadfast defense of freedom of expression and political liberty, even in the face of harassment and arrest, awarded this 17th day of May, 2018.
Queridos amigos, Before we hear from Blanca, you heard that Laura Pallon, one of the original leaders of the ladies, was, died under mysterious circumstances in 2011. We had hoped to have the current leader, Berta Soler, here, but she was not allowed to leave the country. Uh, one of her colleagues was told that they could, she could leave the country on May 18th, tomorrow. Um, but Berta has a uh, brief video that we were able to uh, to, uh, to transmit. Estimados amigos, defensores y promotores de la libertad, este reconocimiento significa solidaridad con las víctimas y a la vez nuestro compromiso de no apartarnos de la palabra empeñada con los que hoy están tras la reja en Cuba por levantarse en busca de la libertad y un futuro mejor para todos los cubanos. Este reconocimiento se lo dedicamos a Laura Poyán, a todos los presos políticos cubanos y a todos los que han confiado en nosotras. Finalmente, las damas de blanco, reiteramos nuestro agradecimiento a todos los que hicieron posible este importante reconocimiento. Gracias a todos y que Dios los bendiga. And now we'll hear from Blanca Reyes. Queridos amigos, Nuestras, palabras, nuestras primeras palabras para la Junta Directiva de la, de, la, de, la, directiva de la Cato, para todas las personas que han promovido y avalado el premio Milton Freeman a las damas de blanco y para quienes han tenido la cortesía y la gentileza de acompañarnos hoy aquí. Tienen que, tiene que ser de gratitud, de regocijo y de emoción, porque esos sentimientos son los que acompañan ahora mismo a las mujeres que allá lejos, en la isla de Cuba, salen todos los días a luchar por la libertad de los presos políticos y la democracia de su país. Dear friends, to the Board of Directors of the Cato Institute, to all the people who have promoted and endorsed the Milton Friedman Award to the Ladies in White, and for those who have had the courtesy and kindness to accompany us here today, our first words must be of gratitude, joy, and excitement because those feelings right now are accompanying those women on the island of Cuba who every day fight for freedom of political prisoners and democracy for our country. El, gal el galardón que recibimos esta noche tiene un prestigio y una fuerza moral de rango internacional que de repente pasa a respaldar una labor que se realiza con humildad bajo la más brutal represión, casi sin reportes de prensa, sin protagonismo circense, con una vocación de entrega y de firmeza, solo comparable al empeño de ver libres a los prisioneros, libre la patria y hecho realidad el progreso y las transformaciones positivas de la nación. The award that we are receiving tonight has an international prestige and a moral force that explicitly support a toil that is carried out with humility under the most brutal repression, almost without press coverage without protagonism, with a vocation of commitment and firmness, comparable only to their determination to see our prisoners released, our country free, and the reality of positive transformations for our nation. En efecto, ese es el mayor significado del Milton Frima, para un grupo de mujeres cubanas que enfrentan cada hora un régimen dictatorial con un arsenal que incluye oraciones, talleres literarios, misas en las iglesias y pacíficos desfiles silenciosos en los que se lleva en la mano un simple gladiolo y las flores deben tener algún mensaje de peligro para los represores. Indeed, that is the greatest significance of the Milton Friedman Award for a group of Cuban women who daily face a dictatorial regime with an arsenal that includes prayers, literary workshops, mass and silent marches, 
carrying in their hands a simple gladiola, flowers which must surely contain dangerous messages for their repressors. Caminatas, lecturas de cartas de más de los 140 cubanos que están en las 200 cárceles del territorio nacional, oraciones, poemas y flores. Ese es el instrumento de las damas de blanco que empezaron sus peregrinaciones en la iglesia de Santa Rita, en las barriadas habaneras de Miramar y se han extendido a otras provincias, entre las que se destacan especialmente Matanza, Holguín, Santiago de Cuba y Guantánamo. Walks, readings of letters from more than 140 political prisoners throughout 200 prisons in Cuba, prayers, poems, and flowers, that is the wherewithal of the ladies in white who began their pilgrimage in the church of Santa Rita Miramar in a neighborhood of Havana and have spread to other provinces. Their activism in Matanzas, Holguin, Santiago de Cuba, Guantanamo is especially noteworthy. En un instante como este de fiesta y alegría, no puedo negar que está con nosotros en esta velada extraordinaria el espíritu de nuestra hermana Laura Poyán, su gestora inicial de las Damas de Blanco, y quien le transmitió su pureza, su afán de unidad y cohesión y las alternativas de su cordialidad. Allá, en su modesta casa del centro de La Habana, tuvimos nuestra primera sede y de esa sala salimos a toda Cuba. At a moment like this, of merriment and joy in this extraordinary evening, I am sure that among us is the spirit of her sister, Laura Poyan, the initial leader of the Ladies in White, who conveyed to the movement her desire for unity and cordiality. In her modest home in central Havana, we had her first headquarters. And from her living room, we spread throughout Cuba. Y pueden estar seguros de que también está Berta Soler, que ha tenido que enviar un discurso grabado porque la policía política no le permitió viajar como suele hacer. Y es por eso que la querida Berta está más cerca que nunca de nosotros. Se siente aquí al lado, con todo el rigor de su liderazgo, el vigor de su gestión y el coraje que enseña en la dirección de una institución perseguida y odiada por la dictadura militar, pero con la señora Soler en su vanguardia, acaba de cumplir 15 años. Muchas gracias. You can be sure that among us is also Berta Soler, who had to send her recorded speech because once more the political police did not allow her to travel. Our beloved Berta is closer than ever to us. We can feel her here next to us with all her consistency and fortitude of leadership. The courage she shows in guiding an institution, persecuted and hated by the Cuban military dictatorship. But with Mrs. Soler at its vanguard, it just celebrated its 15th anniversary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the ladies in white for their courage. I'd like to thank the members of our host committee for their great generosity in support of this event. And I'd really like to thank our incredible event staff for putting on a flawless evening. Please join us for continued conversation and libation. But thanks to the laws of the United States, there will be no Cuban rum. And thanks to the laws of the city of New York, there will be no cigars of any kind. Please join us. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And thanks for being here. <laughs> 